take your Bible and find John chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6. I'm in a series of messages that I'm calling Sorry, Not Sorry, Breaking Through Cultural Lies. The lie of the culture that we will deal with this morning is there are no absolute truths. There are no absolute truths. We're going to begin our look at four or five different passages of Scripture with John chapter 14 and verse 6. Let me read that and then we're going to pray for each other. I, I want you to pray for me and I want you to ask the Lord to not let anything distract you that you would not hear all that he needs to teach you and show you this morning. John chapter 14 and verse 6 is probably not a new verse to hardly anybody here, but let me, let me read it. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Let's pray. And again, pray for me. Say, Lord, speak through my pastor today and fill him with your spirits. Pray for yourself that you would just be attentive and listening and attuned to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you. Let's pray for one another. Heavenly Father, just thank you for the opportunity to declare your word today. Father, as I listen to that, just that last song, I, I just feel like, Father, that, that I need to repeat a line because somebody needs to hear that, that they can find the blessing in the broken pieces. And His name is Jesus. So whoever, Father, that needed to be said for today, I pray they heard it as Tim and Sarah sang, and they would indeed find the blessing in whatever brokenness they are experiencing right now. Father, I, we turn our uh, thoughts now to your word. We are facing an increasing lie of the culture that tells us that there is no absolute truth. Equip us, Father, to answer that biblically. So speak, Father, through me and to us today. I pray that, ask that. Amen. I got to thinking this week about things that our kids, you, your, your kids, your grandkids will never know. Because they're gone from society. I, I, I call these you, but not your kids. And I came up with five. There's probably a dozen or more. But I came up with five. You, but not your kids. First one, car keys. <laughs> I, I, I have a son that starts his car before he leaves the inside of my house to go home. I have a daughter that pushes a button to start her car. You, but not your kids. Car keys. Second thing is, making a trip to the VHS rental store. I, I hope your 401k was not heavily invested in Blockbuster. Number three, watching Saturday morning cartoons. The best babysitters ever. The fourth one. Using a printed map. Now, get that out of the glove compartment, Deborah, and let's see if we can find our way. No, I am, I am glad about this one because I could never get the darn thing folded back upright to start with. Number five. Calling someone 
and having to ask to speak to them. Hello, may I speak to Charles? Hello, is Sharon there? That never happens anymore. And then let me give you an added one because it's kind of on the other end of this. Your phone ringing and you not knowing who it is. Now, can you imagine the frightening world of your phone ringing on the wall? And you, who, who's calling us? Who, who's calling us? We, we, you, we have, you have to pick it up to see who's calling you. Calling someone, not knowing who it is, or calling someone and asking, I mean actually having uh, to ask to speak to them. There's something else, there's another thing that is quickly passing from our society if it's not already gone, and that's the idea, the concept of absolute truth. The title of this message is The Lie from the Culture That We Need to Break Through. There are absolutely no absolute truths. Now you can see the ridiculous nature of that statement. Besides being a lie, to claim there are no absolute truths is a statement of absolute truth. Absurd. First, let me define the term. Absolute truth is that which is true for all people at all times in all places. A fact that cannot be changed. John 14 verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So my life point this morning is this, to believe in Jesus, because that's what 14.1 14.1 says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. To believe in Jesus is to confess that He is the truth. Christianity is ultimately about truth. The truth of Jesus. His person, who He is, and His work, what He did. Who He is, He is, he is God in the flesh. Who He is, the fullness of God, lives in Jesus. What He did was He died on a cross for the sins of all people. And He rose again from the dead, conquering death. He is truth. Now, please understand me. Truth is either objective, and that's the same thing as absolute truth. Truth is either objective truth or subjective truth it it comes from a standard truth does it either comes from a standard outside yourself that's objective absolute truth truth either comes from a standard outside yourself or it comes from a standard you have arrived at absolute truth comes from a standard Outside yourself. And it doesn't matter what conclusion you've arrived at. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter what your preferences are. It does not change absolute truth. Chick-fil-A is the best fast food restaurant in America. Now, is... Is that subjective truth or is that objective truth? If it's it's subjective truth, it's my opinion. Joe Scally has a different opinion about that. (laughs) But for me to say, to stand here flat-footed and declare that Chick-fil-A is the best fast food restaurant in America, tomorrow I might change my mind. And so that is subjective truth. It is a standard that I have arrived at. And that's exactly what the culture's done. 
Truth has changed. It is changing. It's based on how you feel, how I feel. It's based on what my preferences, your preferences are. It's based on what your opinions are. You have your truth, but that's not true for me. I have my own truth. You have yours, I have mine, we'll get along just fine. But you can't do that if you believe in absolute truth. And as a Christian, it's anchored to a person and his name is Jesus. Look at John 14, 6 again. Jesus is not saying here that he teaches people the truth. He is saying here he himself is the truth. And he's the truth about everything. He's the truth about the whole created order. From everything that has been created to men and women who were created in God's image, Jesus is truth. Now, this verse is often criticized because it's narrow. It's exclusive. It's, it's offensive. You're trying to tell me, Pastor, that Jesus is the only route to God that's narrow, that is offensive, that is exclusive. But listen to me, friend. All truth is narrow. Mathematical truth is narrow. Two plus two equals four. All day long. Yesterday. Tomorrow. Two plus two equals four. Scientific truth is narrow. Water is H2O. It's not H3O. It's not H2O2. No. Water is H2O. Historical truth is narrow. They flew those planes into the building on September the 11th, 2001. Not September the 12th, the 10th. So, mathematical truth is narrow. Scientific truth is narrow. Historical truth is narrow. Why, why wouldn't spiritual truth be narrow? Jesus is truth. For all people, at all times, in all situations, in all places. And that will never change. To believe in Jesus is to confess that He is the truth. Now, let me show you the role that truth plays in our lives. And there are three roles that I want to emphasize this morning. Again, probably more, but three I want to show you from Scripture and emphasize. The first one is this. Truth is the answer to finding freedom. Look at John 8, 32. If you want to turn with me, just back a couple of pages in your Bible to John chapter 8 and verse 32. Truth is a very important concept to John. John uses the term truth 25 times in his gospel. Matthew uses the term one time. Mark and Luke each use the term truth three times. John uses the term truth 25 times. I think it was important to him that we knew the truth. In this eighth chapter of John, he uses the term truth Nine times. And just to kind of give you a feel for it, we'll get back up to verse 32 in a minute, but look at verse 40. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. Look at verse 45. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Look at verse 46. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? But again, back to verse 32. Truth is the answer to finding freedom. John 8, 32 says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus speaks truth because he is truth. Truth is centered in the person of Jesus. And so truth is what Jesus communicates to us. His truth, when you know him, makes you free. Sets you free. 
It delivers you from bondage. It releases you from spiritual chains. Truth is what saves men and women from the bondage of sin, the bondage of lies, and the bondage of errors. Jesus said something similar in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 when he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed. We live in a culture that is held captive by the lie of subjective truth. We live in a culture that is blind to absolute truth. The culture that you and I live in tells us that all truth claims are subjective. Listen, abortion is wrong. Abortion is wrong for me. Christianity is true. Christianity is true for you. Do you see there's a world of difference between the first statement and the second statement? The first statement and the second statement. A world of difference between abortion is wrong and abortion is wrong for you, for me. Most in our culture would be fine with the second statement. They'd be respectful of your views. Christianity is true for you. Most of the culture would be respective of, of, of that view, although the culture is growing increasingly hostile to certain truths. But, but for now, the culture is okay with it being true for you, but not for them. Where we get into trouble with the culture is when we say to them, no, it's not just my truth. It's true for you as well. It is absolute truth. Now listen to me, mom and dad. Listen to me, grandparents. Be careful when teaching your children about truth that they don't get the impression that they can add for us on to the end of what you are teaching them. We believe this. This is the truth we believe. It is true for us. And you're telling that to your children. Don't let them get the impression that they can add the for us. Or worse, that they add for you. Meaning mom and dad. Oh, That's mom's truth. That's dad's truth. That's what dad believes. Christianity is true for him. Be careful they don't get the impression. Now, listen, I got to thinking about this week. Listen, here's one of the ways the church is guilty of this. Here's one of the ways that the church, and, and I've done it, you've probably done it. Here's one of the ways the church falls into the trap falls captive to the thinking of this culture. We're all sitting around on Sunday morning studying our Bibles, and we're all sitting around in a home group studying our Bible. We've all got our Bible on our lap, or we've got our Bible on the app on our phone, and we're studying the Bible, and and we ask the question, okay, okay there, Charles, what, what does that verse mean to you? It makes no difference what that verse means to Charles. Makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. What does that verse mean to you? What does that verse mean to you? Well, now, okay, tell what that verse means. No, 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 no. What it means to you is not the standard. What was the author trying to say to his original audience? That's the question. What was the author trying to say to his audience? Now, that's a whole nother sermon in theology, okay? It, it, in hermeneutics, it's a whole nother sermon. But when we ask somebody, what does that verse mean to you? Eh, makes no difference what it means to them. So when you add for you, to you, for me, on the end of statements, 
you've crossed over into the realm of subjective truth. And the end of that, the result of that is chaos. Not freedom. You see, I've heard the culture say, find the truth that works for you. That sounds nice. Find the truth that works for you. You be you. Find the truth that works for you. That sounds tolerant. That that sounds open-minded. But what if what works for them is flying planes into buildings in the name of their God? Works for them. If we really wanted to go down the road of find the truth that works for you, we'd empty the jails. Because just what works for you may be smash and grab jewelry stores. Maybe sucker punching somebody on the streets of New York City. So the next time someone tells you there is no absolute truth, you have my permission to punch him in the mouth. <laughs> and see what they think about, well, that works for me. And when they say, hey, what are you doing? It's not right for you to hit me in the mouth. You say, well, what's right for you is not necessarily right for me. The sad truth, dear family is the culture is already a long way down this road. No laws. No standards that are enforced. And it's chaos in our culture. It's chaos legally. It's chaos morally. And worse, it is chaos spiritually. Listen to me. Do you hear Jesus? To know truth is to be free. Individually and corporately as a society. Because you see, when you live the truth of Jesus, you know who you are. You know where you came from. You know where you're headed. Lies bind people. Truth frees people. Lies prevent people from enjoying true freedom. Truth allows people to reach their full potential and find real fulfillment. Truth is the answer to finding freedom. Here's the second role that truth plays in our life. If you'll just turn over a couple pages to John chapter 16 and verse 13, you will find these words. Jesus speaks and says... But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will disclose to you what is to come. Truth is the avenue on which we live our lives. The Holy Spirit, what's He doing? (laughs) What's He up to in your life? He is in your life to guide you into truth. There are avenues of truth that the Spirit needs to teach you to walk in. And as the days go by, the Holy Spirit will lead you deeper and deeper into truth. He opens your eyes. He directs your feet. The culture, though, is hostile and ignorant of the truth. And, and, and into this culture, Jesus sends us. We need a guide. We need a path to walk on. We need an avenue on which to, to, to walk down. And the Holy Spirit is our guide. Now think with me. When you hear the word guide, I think of two things. When I hear the word guide, I, I think of the fact that we are all on a pilgrimage. We are to navigate this culture. You you hire a guide to help navigate, to show you where the fish are so you can catch all the big ones. You have a guide that helps you navigate the trail that you want to hike this afternoon. A guide means we are all on a pilgrimage and we are to navigate this culture that we live in by being led by the Holy Spirit. 
Parents, teach that concept to your children. That it's an adventure to live in this world guided by Holy Spirit. That we are on a pilgrimage with Him. And if we follow Him, He will lead us to truth. The second thing a guide does, it reminds me of the fact that we are all in a process. A guide is to get us to the destination. So none of us have arrived. We haven't learned it all yet. Because what? Truth is something that is discovered. Not something invented. Isaac Newton did not invent gravity. He discovered it. It was there all along. He just discovered it. Contrast these two biblical ideas. The fact that we're on a pilgrimage to discover truth. As we are guided by the Holy Spirit. And all of us are still in process. Contrast that with the lies of the culture. You figure out your own truth. Nobody gets to claim they know the truth. You get to find your own truth. It's all up to you. And you can decide for yourself. So follow your heart. And whatever you feel is right for you. Folks, we're living now with the implications and the result of that false thinking playing out in our culture. I'll identify as this. I'll identify as that. Listen again to Jesus. Who says in John 17. You're not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You see, part of that high priestly prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane that night was he was praying for you and me that we might be set apart, separate. That followers of Jesus are not to follow the culture, but they're to follow the truth. As the Holy Spirit leads them on that truth. Yes, we live in this culture. But we live on a higher plane. We live according to the higher standard. We live according to the truth of Jesus. Holy, set apart men and women who live truth. And whose lives, excuse me, whose lives are anchored to this word. Your word is truth. So truth is the answer to finding freedom. Truth is the avenue on which we live our lives. And then you're going to have to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Sorry I couldn't keep you in the gospel of John. But you're going to have to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. To see what I want to show you as we wrap this up. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. Here's the third role that truth plays in our life. Truth is the armor you wear to fight your battle. The first piece of armor that that is described here in in, in Ephesians 6 beginning in verse 10 is this armor of God that, that you and I are to put on. Stand firm therefore having girded your loins with truth. The battle in our culture today is a spiritual battle. You know that. And so you and I are to go out every day wearing this armor that, the, that Ephesians 6 outlines for us. And you and I are to put it on. You and I are to take it up to fight our battles. And the first piece right around our midsection literally is the belt of truth. Having girded your loins, said nobody ever this week in daily conversation. Hey, Scott, you girded your loins today? What? No. (laughs) The plain English of that is wear the belt of truth. And it literally was a leather belt, three to five inches thick, around the midsection of a Roman soldier. It held everything together, and stuck in it was his sword, which is the Word of God. And the command here in this verse 
Stand firm. That is a command. Stand firm, brother. Stand firm, sister. In this culture. Don't be defeated by the culture. Don't swallow its lies. Stand firm, brother. Having on the belt of truth. That is your responsibility to put it on. Stand firm is the command. Put on the belt of truth is your responsibility. It was that essential part of the soldier's army, as I soldier's armor, as I told you, that holds everything else in place. You stood your ground by standing firm in the truth. You combat the culture by being controlled by the truth. You live your days walking in the truth. We we live in a culture that wants to tear down absolute truth. Because when you tear down absolute truth, you have no objective standard, particularly of morality. And if you criticize anyone's moral choice, no matter how evil it is, it is seen as hate speech in this culture. You can't even call it evil. The culture is beginning to see truth as a bully. As synonymous with power and oppression. They're telling us that truth is a power play. That tolerance and diversity must win the day. People bristle when you tell them that their lifestyle is is wrong. You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me what to feel. Equity and fairness have become the highest virtues to which we all must bow. In a discussion about truth one day, President Abraham Lincoln asked a gathering of people, how many legs would a sheep have if you called its tail a leg? The crowd answered, five. Lincoln responded, no. It would only have four legs. Calling a tail a leg doesn't make it one. We live in a culture that believes calling a tail a leg makes it one. You can call it a marriage. You can identify as a woman. You can call it a fetus and kill it. Calling it doesn't make it so. Our battle requires we put on the belt of truth every day day now li- listen to me I want to close with just some, some counsel and advice to parents and grandparents and I, I put them on the screen for you in case you wanted to write them down you wouldn't have to write them real fast while I talk parents and grandparents teach your children the difference between objective and subjective truth Teach them that Dairy Queen is just as good as (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Teach them the difference between objective and subjective truth. Second one up there is show them that speaking the truth is not a power play or hate speech. By you yourself, and that's the idea of what I meant. You yourself, give them an example of how to speak the truth. In love. You demonstrate the correct way. To speak the truth. The hard truth. In love. Truth is not a power play. It's not hate speech. Number three. Help them recognize the culture's lies. Whether it's an idea. Whether it's a concept. Whether it's a belief. Help them recognize the culture's lies. And then finally, point them to the one who is ultimate truth, Jesus Christ. Truth is a person. His name is Jesus. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, you are the rock of truth upon which we stand. 
You are our sure foundation. Let us build our lives upon You. Not upon the sinking sand of cultural lies and false ideas. Thank you that absolute truth is true at all times and for all people and in all situations. Let us experience and let us teach our children to experience the truth that sets us free. And Lord Jesus, give each of us the courage and the wisdom to push back against the culture's lies. To push back against the lie of there being no absolute truth. And let us remember that our battle is not against flesh and blood. But we are in spiritual warfare. May prayer and truth be our weapons. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you for watching today. I'm so glad you tuned in, logged on to our streaming service here at First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Texas. If you have made a decision to become a Christ follower, if you've made a decision to trust Christ, I would love to hear about that decision. Would you email me? My email address is simple. It's pepper at fbcmv.com. That's pepper at fbcmv.com. Or if you have questions about what it means to be a Christ follower, to be a Christian, please email me and I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Also, if you have prayer requests, if you want me to pray with you about something, email me as well. I'll be glad to take your prayer request and we can pray about it together. And again, thank you for watching today. If you do not have a church home, I hope you consider First Baptist Church, Mount Vernon, Texas, your church home. God's best on you today.